yank at the mic, um, please just remind the person who might be answering your question to repeat the question uh, so that everybody can hear it. And uh, as you'll find out in just a minute, we are recording this, so we want to be able to make sure that, um, that any questions that are asked get recorded too. Uh, hey, Forrest. Hey, Forrest, everybody. Hi, Forrest. Um, the agenda tonight. So we have some announcements that I'm doing right now. We'll do some quick intros. Um, we have two really good talks tonight that I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. Some quick closing remarks. And then typically we go to uh, Bill's bar downstairs um, and have a little bit of an of a after, after evening beverage um, and socializing. So please join for some after evening beverage and socializing. Um, that is on the entrance on 51st Street. Um, I, don't, I always get it wrong, so if you go to the, the upper level bar and there's nobody there, then go to the lower level bar. And if you go to the lower level bar and nobody's there, then go to the upper level bar. But there are two bars at Bill's Bar, so look around. Make sure that you recognize people so that when you go to Bill's Bar, you can recognize who you're looking for. All right. Talks. We have two terrific talks tonight. One um, by Nick Selvaggio, and I, I checked on the pronunciation of that. I got it pretty good. Excellent. Uh, he's going to be talking about breaking down barriers to entry for new developers. Um, really good topic, so that'll be a, a, a talk that will go on in just a little bit. And then Elijah Lynn um, is going to be talking about uh, PHP performance profiling with Blackfire. It's a very cool tool, and he's been demoing it to, to my team recently. A little quick side note for those of you uh, who've been here a lot. You've seen Elijah. He's been uh, one of the driving forces of this meetup for a while. Um, but unfortunately, this is going to be Elijah's last meetup here in New York because he's moving to Portland, Oregon. Uh, he finally got the memo that there is no city that is more appropriate for Elijah Lynn than Portland, Oregon. So he's he, he finally figured that one out. So he's going to be moving there. Um, but he'll come back and visit, he says, and he'll, uh, he'll time it out with this meetup so he can come. Uh, I, I'm just telling him this now. He doesn't know that he's doing that. Um, but everybody make sure and, you know, Thank Elijah. He's been he's really been doing a lot of the work for this meetup uh, along with the other um, the other folks that that uh, organize it for a while. So, you know, shake his hand, say thank you, wish him well on his travels to the West Coast. And then, uh, because Elijah is leaving, uh, I need to hire people. So come talk to me right after you congratulate Elijah. Okay. Um, uh, organizers, so uh, those are your organizers. Take a look at the pictures of the people in that photo, that photo right there. Organizers, just wave your hands real quick. Yay! So the reason that we like to point out the organizers is um, that we want to make sure that as you have feedback about these events and as you have feedback about these meetups, we want to, you know, make sure that you know who to give that feedback to, who to talk to about suggestions, who to talk to about um, the, the talks, the, the location, the format. Uh, whatever it is that's on your mind that you think could be better, um, let us know. And we are very, very, very open to feedback. We love getting feedback. So talk to any of the people in that photo uh, or who wave their hands. And, uh, and we really do take it seriously. So please do give us good feedback. Um, uh, oh, there's a chip-in that's been set up to help um, offset some of the meetup.com costs. Um, we do pay uh, a small yearly fee for meetup.com, and it would be really terrific if the members of this um, meetup could, you know, chip in a couple bucks and, and make sure that we kind of share the wealth, or I guess we're not sharing the wealth at that point. We're doing the opposite of sharing the wealth. Um, but sharing sharing the burden, let's say, um, and uh, that would be terrific. So if you go to meetup.com slash drupalnyc slash contribute, that would be terrific. Uh, every little bit, you know, helps out. So please do do that. Uh, venue Food and Drinks is sponsored by our good friends here at NBC Universal Technology. Um, we're always very grateful to them. Yay, NBC Universal Technology! Woo! Um, and and as as a special thank you for um, for giving you pizza and and beverages and sponsoring this nice location, we just ask that you stop by and say hello to our friends in the back and out there and and uh, apply for a job. Okay. Uh, after party, our after party that we have each uh, month is uh, sponsored by our good friends at Fastly. Yay, Fastly! Woo! <laughs> Fastly is a, is, a, is a CDN that's out there making waves, so check out their, uh, their Fastly products um, and say thank you to them for buying you a drink. Okay. Um, uh, photos, and ha uh, photos and hashtags. So we do take photos at these events. We do ask that other people take photos at these events. And we ask that if you're going to post them online to use the hashtag uh, DrupalNYC. Um, you, most people tend to, to post them on meetup.com slash DrupalNYC or on Twitter or on Instagram. Please use that hashtag because we do like to um, make everybody who doesn't show up to our meetups a little bit jealous that they missed out on all the good fun. Um, and it, it does serve as you know an, an advertisement for what a fun group that we have here each month. So. Um, 
if you take photos, please do that. Next, here we go. Uh, ooh, a new slide. No one has seen this slide before. Thank you, Mai. Um, we now have a Slack channel for Drupal NYC. Uh, our Slack channel is at drupalnyc.slack.com. Um, please uh, join by going to drupal.nyc slash chat. And um, you know, it's a, it's a good place to kind of uh, schmooze with the organizers, with the other members of this community here in New York, uh, get ideas for stuff, find out where people are meeting, when meetups are happening. Oh, I forgot that thing. Um, it's a really good place to, uh, to get information like that. I also know that we have conversations in there about just kind of general Drupal goings on from time to time. Um, you know, a couple months ago there were, or I guess maybe a month ago there was a security release and we, you know, we remembered to go in there and say whoever owns the Drupal NYC Twitter, go and you know, make this announcement so that everybody knows about it. That kind of thing goes on in there. Um, so please check it out and, and become, a, become a friend of us on Slack and talk with us and you know, share cat pictures, that's cool. Um, that's it, okay, Slack. Upcoming events. Uh, we have quite a few upcoming events going on. One is our global training day on September 9th and 10th. Um, I believe that's going on here, but I may be wrong about that. I'm wrong about that. I'm getting someone shaking their head. No, 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 no. No, where is that happening? Do, do, do. Just shout it, I'll repeat it, it's cool. It's, it's actually, I think both of these might be online. Um, this is from FFW. We can do the one. Um, these are the ones in New York. Okay. For the New York, New Jersey kind of area. Okay, so I was completely wrong about what this event was, so you can ignore me. Um, but definitely go on to uh, the FFW agency site and, uh, and check out what they have going on so you can participate. Um, each month we do uh, an, a Drupal NYC play day. You can find more information about that on meetup.com slash Drupal NYC. The play days are really meant to show up with your laptop, get your local development environment up and running. If you haven't gotten that running, people can you know, help you out there. If you're a little bit more advanced and you have some more advanced questions, there's usually people who are very advanced that are there and can help you out with that, uh, as long as you kind of turn to the person who doesn't know how to get their local environment set up and help them with that. Right? The idea is to kind of do a Drupal Ladders sort of uh, activity where you help out the person who knows a little bit less than you and somebody else is gonna help you out because they know a little bit more than you. Um, it's a really great, um, it's a really great meetup. It's usually at the, um, the phase two treehouse office on the west side, um, but you can find out more information about that on meetup.com. Um, there is the Long Island Tech Barbecue coming up. That's a new one. Woo! Um, this event is open to anyone involved or interested in tech scene on Long Island and their families. Um, just make sure you register. Um, there's a bit.ly link on there. Register so they know about food and beverages and all that good stuff and make sure that they have room for everybody. Um, if you have more questions about that, ask Nick. Okay. Um, Additionally, DrupalCon Dublin is coming up. I hear the, the pound is doing really shitty, so you should like get a cheap flight and a cheap hotel, make your way out there. Um, coming up in just a couple weeks, I bet you can get a great deal. Brexit. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, but DrupalCon, for those of you who've never been to a DrupalCon, they're amazing events. There are tons of really, really terrific sessions that go on. There are tons of, of boffs, birds of a feather uh, meetups that go on. Um, there's a lot of great socializing with other Drupal-y people. Um, lots of fun things happen. Um, so if you are able to, head out to Dublin. If you're not able to, then start planning now for next spring when it's DrupalCon North America is gonna be in, in Baltimore. We should all just like charter in a cella and go together um, and, uh, and head down there. But definitely start planning that out if you, if you haven't yet. Um, and then finally, the Drupal NYC happy hour. So while this meeting is typically on the first Wednesday of the month, we do a happy hour typically on the last Wednesday of every month. Um, more details on meetup.com slash Drupal at NYC. Um, but everybody who goes there is there to just kind of have a good time, meet good people, have good conversation, have a drink, share a drink. Um, so, you know, come and, and talk. You don't have to talk about Drupal things. You can talk about the Yankees and, and you know, whatever. Um, that's it. Okay. Here we go. Uh, the Drupal Association. Please do join the Drupal Association if you are not yet a member. The Drupal Association is terrific in supporting the Drupal community. They help specifically support Drupal.org, for example, as kind of the main online presence of all the Drupal uh, projects that are going on. Please silence your devices. 
Um, they are the, the main supporters of, uh, of Drupal.org and all those projects. They make sure that we have money for the servers. They support each of the like uh, uh, local groups um, by helping out with, uh, with conferences, with, uh, with camps, with local meetups. Um, they provide support when it comes to even the most mundane things like dealing with like the legalities of renting a location for a, a, a conference that we may have. Um, so definitely support um, the Drupal Association. It really does help everybody if everybody just chips in a couple bucks and, and becomes a member of the Drupal Association, which you can do by going to association.drupal.org slash membership. Um, I really do encourage everybody to do that. Also, for anyone ever looking for a job, it, it kind of, you know, gives you a little... It looks good when people check out your Drupal.org uh, uh, profile page to have that little stamp on there. Um, moving right along. Uh, interested in speaking. Um, so we always, you know, th th there's no point in having these, these meetups every month if we don't have good talks. And we've really had some great success, especially over the last few months, of having great speakers uh, talking about really interesting topics that are interesting to this group. If you have an idea for a topic, you should talk to my friend Ben Jevons right there. If you have an idea for something you would like to hear about, you should talk to my friend Ben Jevons right there. If you have an idea in general of what would make talks more interesting or what would make them more engaging or, hey, it would be great if we could find, you know, Dries to come here and talk about something. What's that? Uh, there's a gentleman over there, Ben Jevons, you can talk to about that. Um, but yeah, in, in all seriousness, um, we do talks that are as quick as a five minute, I learned something new today, um, lightning talks. Uh, I've, I've, I've personally done a lightning talk about, I banged my head on a problem for about four hours the morning of one of these meetups. And that, after, that evening, I came here and I said, this is the problem I banged my head against for the last four hours, and here's how I solved it. I think this is right. And that was great. People came up to me and they were really happy to like learn this one little nugget about the thing that you know, frustrated me. And then that goes all the way through too much more in-depth talks. These are usually 30 or 40 minute talks uh, where we really dig into a particular topic that's interesting to you know, the Drupal community as a whole. Um, and uh, yeah, I really encourage people um, to you know, think about that thing that, that you've been working on for a while and how it might interest the next guy over, the next gal over. Let's hear about it, right? That would be great. So definitely talk to Ben about that. Anything else? No, covered, yes. Okay, um, all right, real quick. Other than NBC Universal, who is always hiring, who's hiring? Okay, in 10 seconds or less, what is the name of your company? Columbia University Medical Center. I've heard of Columbia University Medical Center, and you are hiring a? Senior Drupal developer. Senior Drupal developer, okay. Who else we got? I got hands over here. Uh, Event.inc, and I guess we're hiring a front end developer. Okay. Event.inc? Eventide, okay. With him, okay. All right, and then NBC Universal, we're, we're, we're also hiring a senior Drupal developer and a junior Drupal developer, front-end developers. Um, anyone else? No, okay, who is looking? All right, everybody who's hiring, look around the room. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, awesome, okay, next. What well, we got? Intros. Okay, we used to do intros that took 18 hours to do. We don't do that anymore. Instead, what we do is everybody who's now sitting at one of these tables, uh, introduce to your, yourself to someone else who is sitting at the table near you. And just, you know, introduce yourself. What are you interested in? What are they interested in? Get to know each other. We're going to do five minutes and socialize. And then we're going to come back. We're going to come right back and do this. Okay? So introduce. Go. Nikhil. I need to steal him. I know he's introducing himself right now. Come with me.
I mean, it creates a rabbit and I can add it. That's, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Alright. What's going on in India? You're all alone. And freeze. No one ever freezes when I say that, but everybody eventually like stops, starts paying attention. All right, we're gonna keep going. So I hope you introduce yourself to somebody that was so interesting that you want to talk with them more at Bill's Bar right after this meetup. So see how this works. Uh, okay, so we're gonna get started with our first of um, uh, first of two uh, presentations today. This one is about breaking down barriers for uh, barriers to entry for new developers, and it's gonna be given by Nick. Um, Nick is uh, one of the co-organizers of the Long Island meetup, which I think is in like Bethpage, right? But it's in Huntington now. It moved, very clever, uh, near the train station. It's right in town. All right, so you can, you know, that's that's cool. Huntington's a nice place. No, yeah, come visit the Long Island meetup. When do you guys meet up? Third Wednesday of the month. That's perfect because we are the last Wednesday of the month, so we don't conflict at all. Uh, excellent. Well done. Um, so uh, he joins us from the Long Island User Group, and he's been working with Drupal for over a decade. 
Uh, he's the co-founder of Sago Solutions, uh, and he's going to talk to us all about breaking down barriers to entry. So come on up and let's get you plugged in. While he's plugging in and getting himself settled, um, I'm just going to let you know that um, I have to I have to leave, which is kind of unfortunate. So I'm conscripting Elijah as part of his duties on his last meetup to do the rest of the intros, which is particularly hilarious because the only intro he has to do after this is of Elijah. So I feel like it's appropriate. Um, and everybody make sure to give Elijah a big uh, hug before he leaves. Okay. That's for you or you can use that one. Okay. Is this one good? Check, check, recording? check. Good luck. And I'll hand this to you. Oh, that worked right away. All right. Cool. Excellent. How you doing, guys? Good. Excellent. Very good. Good to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking today. It's the first time I'm doing this talk. I'm really interested to get. Well, I can take the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's worked. Okay. I can take it off. Yeah, I, I got to move around. So is that is that better? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. I actually don't hear it louder. That's that's cool. Um, so this is the first time I'm I'm doing this talk. This is a, a talk about breaking down barriers to entry for new developers. Um, it's focused on a project that we've been working on and using at Sago Solutions for a while now. Um, but it's kind of I, I'm framing it more of a a problem I, that we're seeing when new developers approach um, software development and trying to just get involved and learn new things. So before I get started, hello. Uh, it's, it's been a, a, a long time since I've been here. I would say at least four to five years uh, since I got out here um, to NYC. I've been to a couple of the camps, but none of the meetups. That sounds louder now. <laughs> um, my name's Nick Salvaggio. Uh, I've been using Drupal for a very long time um, in various different capacities. Uh, I run the Long Island Drupal Users Group, as Alex was mentioning. We've been doing that for about five years now. Uh, we're a small group, we're nothing like this, you know, 10, 15 people uh, every month. But we've been doing it consistently, um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a blast. Um, we've started a couple of things, like uh, trydrupal8.com. I don't know if anybody here has, has used trydrupal8.com. Um, we did do that. We're horrible at keeping it up to date, and I apologize for that. Um, I run Sago Solutions, but I, I, that is something I do on the side. I'm actually an IT director for a medical device manufacturer during the day. Um, and I've been kind of balancing that kind of two life thing for a long time now, and it's, it's worked out pretty well. We uh, use Drupal pretty extensively at ADC, the company I work for, uh, for various different things, mostly FDA-related and ISO-related compliance, which is kind of like off the beaten path for, for a lot of us. So today I want to frame a problem, and I want to discuss a couple of solutions. And one of those solutions is, is something that we've we've developed ourselves. Um, there's a problem, and it's, I guess, not a problem, I guess, the way you look at it, but software development is an ever-broadening space to learn new things. And it's never going to stop. Some of us may think that's a bad thing, and some of us may think that's awesome, right? Because we love to learn new things. I particularly enjoy that, at this stage in my life at least. I enjoy to learn new things. I enjoy to learn to dive into new platforms and see if they can be useful and if I can actually use them to add value to the people around me. But it's challenging because we're constantly having to learn new things. I was just having a, a pretty good discussion about um, you know, focusing or, or not learning new things and spending, a, spending time just kind of with your head in the sand, maybe just focusing 100% on Drupal forever. Um, and then as things just pass you on, pass by, um, you can miss out on a lot of things, and you can kind of almost put yourself on an island, as kind of we were doing with Drupal 7, right? Um, so with that, Drupal 8, in particular, has extended our reach, right? It ex it's extended our reach into the broader PHP community. And it's a, a story I always tell is that around the time I think Larry Garfield coined the term, uh, get off the island, this is probably like two, three years ago now. Um, and we were just putting together a little push to get on the island for Long Island Drupal. And we were, we were going to take out ads and stuff, and we were, we were going to get crazy with it. And we decided to nix that, because getting off the island made more sense for Drupal 8 and what we were doing in it. Um, so with Drupal 8, we're, we're, there's actually a lot of cool things that we can now learn that extend our reach outside of just Drupal, right? So Composer. And Composer 
it's a dependency manager, right, for PHP. But that alone, that, that is a bridge to thousands of projects that exist on packages.org that we can now dive into and use. And we can even use them outside of Drupal, which is great. So if we have a little small application that doesn't need a full CMS, we can grab something from Composer and leverage that. Heavy object-oriented programming, so class loading, dependency injection, event listeners. There's a huge breadth of knowledge that we can learn with, with Drupal 8 now that didn't exist in Drupal 7, um, mostly because we're leveraging Symfony and Twig and things like that, other projects that have been alive and thriving for a very long time now that we're now taking advantage of. This is exciting stuff. How many people here are doing production D8 work now? Actually, less than I would think. So that's, um, yeah, so we, we, just, we just finished our second production D8 site. We're not doing any, any large projects. One was mostly front end, and the other one was pretty heavy on the back end. And the back end one was really interesting, very insightful, where I had this kind of purist idea in my mind that I'm going to do all dependency injection. Everything's going to be services, and, and it's going to be all, all D8 OO stuff. That turned out not to be the case. I was writing hooks a lot. <laughs> So again, this pattern is not unique <laughs> to, the, to the Drupal world. And I, I, I was hoping to find more of these. I enjoy searching Giphy <laughs> for these things when I do talks. But um, this is not unique. I mean, for, for folks here, how many people here have uh, you know, used front-end front developers in the JavaScript world, NPM, and things like that? Good amount of us? OK, yeah, more, more than D8. That's, so that world is just insane right now, right? We have all these different tools that we can use. We even have different variants of the language we can use. Do we transpile into ES6? Do we use Babel? Do we use some other transpiler? So it, it's, a, it's an exciting time, but it can be frustrating for a lot of us. So this is kind of a thought experiment. I, you know, everyone might not agree with me with this, but when learning new stacks, we can divide this process into two discrete things. The first is setting up your environment, getting your development environment set up, getting all those tools that you're going to need to be able to run and write the software in that set environment. For, for Drupal, it's PHP. It's usually some type of web server, Nginx or Apache. And it's some type of database server, MySQL or something like that. And then whatever layers you're going to put on top of that to, to like cache stuff or whatever. And then the second part of that is developing and executing software in these set environments. Both require a lot of time to master. And I think even today, we're seeing that both are becoming their own skill sets in itself, right? DevOps is a, is a popular buzzword today. And um, you know, a lot of developers may not have to worry about their environments as much as they did five, 10 years ago. Um, so I believe that when you're initially learning how to think and code, the environment issue should take a back seat. And we do a lot of training at Sago. We do the, uh, the Drupal training days. And we've been doing training for about five years now. And we've trained small groups of people to large groups of people. And there's, there's been a pattern um, that we found. And it's the environment. The environment's always an issue when we're initially training people. Um, you know, Some people may have the environment all set up and ready to go. And some people may not. A story I like to tell about environment issue is I was in 10th grade. Oh, sorry. I was in 10th grade. and there was a web development class. I was so excited to take this class. This is this is an amazing class. I'm like, this web development 10th grade, this is insane. So I took a uh, first day of class. The teacher asked us to set up Apache and integrate Perl to it using CGI. And had nothing to do with writing Perl or even thinking about code at all. It had to do with setting up a web server and then t passing on the requests to, to a Perl interpreter. Most of the class got ridiculously frustrated, was not able to do it. And I kind of understood what he was trying to do. I guess he was trying to, to weed some folks out or see who would really be interested in it. But I think for a lot of the folks that may have been actually good coders, they got, dis they just got frustrated with it and they threw it out. They were not interested anymore. It was too frustrating for them. And they didn't even start writing the code yet, right? That's frustrating too. <laughs> So that kind of always rings, rings a bell in my head when we, when we do training and we see, the, when we see these issues. And people get frustrated with it. They get frustrated, especially when the person next to them is you know, whizzing along. And they're like, oh, yeah, no problem. What are we, gonna do? What are we doing here? You know, like, it's easy. Um, 
So what are some solutions to these problems? I probably should have start, started a timer here. I don't know how I'm looking with time. I think I'm right. So what are some solutions? There's a lot of solutions, right? And there's a growing set of solutions for distributing development environments. Um, some, of the, some of us may use some of these today. Uh, Vagrant, how many people here use Vagrant? Okay, awesome, we got a couple of people. You guys use it to distribute development environments amongst your team? Just local, it just, okay. So Vagrant, Vagrant is a way to have um, Ruby scripts, it's basically a Ruby script that set up a virtual machine um, that can then have all of the tools that you need, your, your environment essentially. Um, and it's reproducible because all you have to do is distribute that script. Uh, so you can share with me your Vagrant file and I could just say Vagrant up and it'll download, configure and things like that. Docker, which is really popular um, and we're leveraging it for Stack Starter, this project I'm about to show off here. Um, Docker is very similar to Vagrant, but it doesn't use VMs. It uses containerization technology to containerize processes on the host machine. So it's faster, um, and you're, you're running the, the core processes, your web server and your, your database server, on the host machine. You're not putting a whole other OS on top of a host OS. So there's a lot of awesome things happening in that space today. Um, switching gears a little bit, there's Acquia Dev Desktop. So this is kind of the go-to solution today for um, Drupal training, a lot of trainers are using this, Acquia Dev Desktop. It's basically an installer that locally installs your Apache, your PHP, and your, and your, um, your database. And it works good. It, there's, there's, no, there's no huge problems with it. Um, you can have multiple environments and things like that. Um, we do find it, it kind of sometimes with different host machines, it just, you know, if they, they like have a program that's listening on port 80 already for some reason, or, you know, there's quirky things that could happen. But a lot of these things open up a whole new set of technologies to learn. So Vagrant, you need to learn how to you know, develop these Vagrant files. Docker, there's a whole Docker file format that you need to learn to be able to declare what these environments are like. So you're gonna have to spend time there, dive into that, and, and learn that. Many of these are focused on production work or sharing within a production team. Um, and a lot of the online learning environments that exist today are what we call REPLs, R-E-P-L, read, eval, print loops. There's a lot of these on the web today. Um, I basically, they, they're like just small environments where you can write a little procedural piece of code. It executes just that small piece of code and then, and then record, sends you the output. A lot of these are very kind of chopped down environments. And a lot of them usually are, are front end. What's, what's the one that's skipping my mind now for JavaScript that's huge? Anybody? What's that? Yeah, if I'm forgetting to name it. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll come to me. So this is where Stack Starter comes into play. Um, Stack Starter is a platform that we've built that um, we've, been, we've been using for about a year, like I said, in our training. And some people here have actually used it before in the, um, in the trainings that we've done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, it's stupid simple, it may be too simple to be like a product, but it, it's useful for us right now. Um, and it's really enabling us to simply distribute development environments when we're doing training. These are not environments that are designed to be production environments. They're not environments to be designed for you to do you know, professional development work in. But they are environments to get new developers into writing the code and thinking in code faster than having to sit there and set up their environments um, or worse yet, leave a training session and not have an environment set up at all and they're now left on their own to figure out how to set everything up so they could just execute some of the things that they just learned. So Stack Starter is comprised of three simple components. The running application, so in our case, we're running Drupal 8, um, which we're gonna need, right? A web-based editor, so it has a, an editor built into the browser that we can edit code directly in the browser. We don't need any locally installed tools. Um, now we, are, we do have a dependency on one thing and that's an internet connection and that could be a problem. Um, but I think that's a problem that you know, we're willing to kind of risk against. We're, we're web developers, I think we need an internet connection. We've also built this to be editor agnostic. I'd like to be able to use other editors. There is a exploding space here with web editors and I think that next, you know, I'll say five years, 
we're going to see a lot of really cool editors hit the web. One, one in particular comes to mind called Eclipse Chi. Anybody hear that? Okay, awesome. So Eclipse Chi looks pretty cool. It's, it's, it's focused on production work. Um, uh, company Code Envy is sponsoring the development. I think they're the, the main driver behind it. Um, it's, check it out. It's, it seems really, really cool. It's an Apache project now. So it's, uh, it seems to have a pretty good community around it. Bless you. And then console access. So console access gives us command line access. We have SSH access to these machines. Um, and we've pre-installed pre the environments with tools that you'd want to use um, within any respected environment. So what are some of the things in Drupal 8 that we'd want to use? Drush, right? And the new, the new guy on the block, Drupal console. Um, so we have Drush and Drupal console pre-installed. Of course, we have Composer pre-installed. So really what we've done is we've built a library of images that we can just spin on demand that include all of these tools bundled together. All this is distributed, what we call via a spin code. And it could be a URL too. We have it, we can put it in the URL. Spin code, quite simply, is just, just like a wireless access code. So one of the first things we notice when we do training is, and it's even here, it's the first thing I did was how do we get connected to the internet? What's the Wi-Fi access? Usually we write it on a board or something, we'll put a you know, Wi-Fi access code on the board. We wanted to be able to distribute that the same, distribute the development environments the same exact way. So we came up with this idea for a spin code. I'd, I'd be interested to see what you guys think of that idea in general, if that makes sense. Um, it's, been, it's been working pretty good. So we do have a spin code today called uh, D8NYC. Um, and if, if you guys want to, you can go to stackstarter.io slash spin and enter the spin code. It'll create an account for you automatically um, and then automatically create an environment for you. So I don't know if anybody's seen this skit. They spin and they spin and they spin and. <laughs> so uh, let, let's dive into a little demo and um, let's spin up a D8 environment. So I actually spun one up already. This is Stack Starter. Um, this is the instructor dashboard. It shows you all the student environments that you have available, and then it has your environment there. Um, if you guys go in and spin up, you'd be brought directly to this page, which shows you the, your environment. Um, and you can see here that it has those three components that I just mentioned. So we have run, edit, and control. Um, simple. And again, this is built to complement a live training right now. So usually what I'll, what I'll do is I'll have my slide deck going and, you know, going through. We don't have anything built yet to, like, include slide decks into these environments and things like that. I'd like to do that if, if, we, if we get the opportunity to. So if we click Run, that'll take us to a running version of Drupal 8. So we have D8 running. And if we click Edit, that takes us into our online editor. Um, currently, we're using a project called uh, Kodiad. It's an open source PHP-based online editor. Um, it's, it's, it seems pretty, pretty cool to work with. I mean, that there's, there's modules that you can include. Um, it's written very procedurally, um, so the modules kind of hook in in a procedural way. Um, it's configurable. Each environment, you could actually hack uh, at, at the editor if you wanted to, if you wanted to change things in it and stuff like that. Um, I liked it because it kind of, it didn't include all of the features that a full-blown IDE would. I, I, I don't want to have a training where people, I have to train them on how to use the IDE. We want to focus on the ideas that, that we're trying to train on, the ideas of the platform for, for, for D8, focusing on like the structure of a module, the, you know, the structure of a service. How do you, how do you inject a service um, into, into other things using dependency injection and stuff like that? Those are ideas that we want to get across. We don't want to say, okay, you need to click this button on the top and go down to the left, to the right, and this and that. Um, we want to stay clear of that, which I'm a little wor worried with Eclipse Chi because it seems like it's, it's, it's turning into like Eclipse, which is this massive IDE that never ends. Um, so this is pretty cool. We have, a, we have a full editor here. It's got some error reporting and stuff like that. It is modular, and you can go out there to a marketplace and download these different modules. Um, one thing that we'd like to get going on here, and we have it in kind of just a test environment right now, is collaborative coding. So being able to connect to a student environment and show them, go right to a line and say, hey, check this out, you're missing a semicolon here or whatever. Um, 
and that's all open source. And it doesn't, I mean, it's a pretty active project, but not that active. Not like Drupal. So the th third part of this is console access. Uh, console access is actually leveraging a project called tty.js. Um, it's a way to expose the uh, terminal right in the browser. So we have terminal access here. And let me put this in here. Uh, all right, I'll type it one hand. Zoom in a little bit there. So we have full terminal access. We do have Drush installed, if I spell Drush correctly, I don't spell status. So we can go out there and do things like Drush, DL, Devel, and then I'll go out there and pull down these environments. I'll pull down the, the, the project. Um, so that's console access. Now, one thing that somebody may have noticed is that this is, this is pretty horribly insecure. It's not something that we're designing, again, for production use. This is something we're using kind of during a training session and then keeping it around for a little while and then ultimately getting rid of the environments. Um, but the, the kind of model we're trying to build around it is, um, you know, you, you sign up for a period of time. So say I'm, I'm doing a training for two days. I would keep them around for maybe two weeks. So I don't really see this as a subscription type service. I could be wrong about that. Um, but more of a, you know, I'm doing training and I can buy this block of time to be able to spin these development environments around. Um, I'd definitely be interested to see if that, if you guys think that makes sense or any feedback you have on that. But that's pretty much Stack Starter. I mean, it's simple. It, it's, it's designed to be able to easily distribute development environments. And, um, I think it's solving a problem for us when we, when we do training. Uh, this way, we literally get moving right away when we do this training, right away. We, we spend five minutes doing intros and this and that, and we could dive right into the curriculum. Uh, before we had this, we, we were hiring assistants. We were having people go around and help with the, with the environments. And those people were left in the dust, because usually we have one or two days to cover topics that are you know one to two years worth of stuff that we've learned, right? And it's, you want to get a lot out of it. Um, so this has is, this is kind of helped us. Um, some other features that we're, we're looking at doing is an instructor syncing. So for site building courses especially, when you're doing site building, um, you're doing a lot of like you're configuring a view, you're doing this, you're, you're, you're kind of doing a lot of stuff in the UI. It's very easy to get kind of behind, right? So somebody might maybe keeping up on the other person just kind of getting behind. If they get behind one day and it's a two, three day training, they're lost on the second day. And they're not gonna catch up. They're not gonna get as much of the training as they, as they could. Um, so instructor syncing, BMO will say, sync me with the instructor. Get me up to speed with my environment quickly. Um, they still lose some of that content, but at least they can actually play now from that point on. Um, so we, we actually have that working too. I'm kind of keeping some of these, we haven't really launched this yet. I'm trying to keep keeping this kind of in, the, in my pocket so when we, we launch, we can start pushing out new features. Um, but I wanted to come down here today. I wanted to show you guys what we're doing here. Thank you, Mai, for giving me the courage to get up here and do this, and Ben for you know persisting with me. It's been a couple of months we've been talking about this. And um, yeah, so it's, it's good to be here. And that is pretty much my talk. Any questions? Where are they getting spun up at on Amazon? These are each Docker containers? Yes, yes. So they're, they're, what we did was truly really, the project is, is three, it's three projects. We, we have the, a Drupal front end that's the dashboard and all that type of stuff. Um, we built a Docker library that in, it's a, it's a, a, we call it stack base. So it's the base image that contains the editor and things like that. And then on top of that, we've built a bunch of environments. Um, right now, we're using DigitalOcean as our, our cloud vendor. Um, that may change because the, the one thing with DigitalOcean is when the, it's not being used, even when it's powered off, you're still getting charged for it. So that kind of like complicates things a little bit in terms of how we can price this in a way that I think makes sense. Amazon's a little different where we can do things like detect whether or not they're being used and shut down and not be charged. Um, and then when, you, when one person hits it, spin it up. Um, I think Pantheon's doing stuff like that with, with their environments. Um,
Yeah. Yeah, so it's a good question. So we have four, um, it's basically one instance, one server for each environment. And we have, based on the number of seats, we, we spin up larger environment, larger servers. Um, I, wa I want to be able to do shared stuff where there's like a developer plan. Um, but I think that's going to open up a can of worms for us. You know, where we're, we're just openly saying spin development environments and I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> But we'll probably, we, we did that with TriDrupal 8. That's really kind of where uh, this stemmed from too, is, is TriDrupal 8 is exactly that. We created a, a Docker image that when you click the button, it just spins up a new D8 environment. No console access, no editor access. And um, that, we were, at first it was horribly, horribly, it was going down every second. It was, it was mentioned, I think, at like Drupal Camp London or something like that a number of years back. And it was just, it went right down. Like, damn it. So we, we wrote some stuff to keep, like, automate the spinning down of the environments, and that's been kind of stable. We just are horrible keeping the versions up to date. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Um, can you talk about, like, all right, so for the training, you probably are checking out some repository. Can you speak more to how you're setting it up with the Stack Starter environment? Yeah, so right now, the base images are, are pre-configured with the project that we're training on. So we'll, we'll check out these projects when we build the images. So when you, when you spin, um, it's already there, th those projects. Git is pre-installed and everything, so you can go out there and clone down. Um, initially, we had the environments be uh, set in um, a bare Git mode where you can, you can push to them, and then it would automatically check out still think that's kind of interesting, but we, we went away with that because I think in, in trainings it was more likely we were going out and grabbing stuff than pushing stuff up. I mean, it, it kind of went against the whole model of like, you don't need anything locally, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that's working now. Any other questions? So um, I've done a lot of trainings too, and I was wondering uh, like, for instance, we did the uh, DevOps uh, training at DrupalCon last year. Um, or I guess it was still this year. Um, how do you deal with the internet going out? So, I mean, it's always been an issue. Uh, the internet's always really crappy, at least at the conferences. Um, is there any, like, kind of things you've thought of to solve that problem? Yeah, so, I mean, luckily we haven't, we haven't really had that problem. Um, but I've always got a backup on me if I, if I got to go local. You know, we'll, we'll have Acquia Dev Desktop ready to go in case catastrophic failure of the internet. Um, we do have a couple of ideas. I, I'd like to get to the point where we can um, we can take these Docker images and bring them local without any complicated. You need to install 15 things. Um, I have a couple of ideas there. A company um, you guys probably heard of in Calamunda, out in Cali. Um, they're doing some really interesting work with that. And uh, I, I'd like to have maybe a conversation with those guys to see if there's some synergy there to, instead of us developing it, we can pull in stack starter instances to their stuff. I've got a mm -hmm. question as well. I missed if you said this about um, in, in courses of like when you're training, if you wanted to sort of get everybody to a certain point, could you sort of start with a version of maybe Drupal 8 where there's already tags and all the code's at a certain point and you can sort of like, Put a button and jump everybody to the particular like you know spot where they should be and that sort of idea. Yeah, so um, totally can do that, and we we've done that for a couple of guys. We've got the, testing this out. We pre-configured it with like a, a theme set and things like that that they can do, and they, the tagging on GitHub where we can check out tags. I'd like to be able to get to the point where people can create their own image and then distribute that image. So if you're training on something really specific, like the neat theme in Drupal 8, um, you can go in there and pre-install it and then say, all right, I want to create a spin code off of this environment, not some canned environment that we've already created. Um, and that's it's totally possible we can do it. Right now I'm thinking that you know, I want to try to get people using this and see if there's any, any value in it. Um, and we can totally create those environments for our customers. Um, you know, we probably do it for nothing because we want people to use it right now. So we'll, we'll set up the environment and create those spin codes off of it. Anything else? So thank you guys for having me out here. Um, again, come out to Long Island sometime. I know it's a tall ask to come out to Long Island here. In <laughs> you what? Are you from Long Island? Yeah, I live there. Oh, awesome. Where at? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, you got to come out. Third Wednesday. We're, we're trying to grow it. We, we've got a barbecue in a couple of weeks that we're, we're, we're putting together a lot of the tech. Like, we have a lot of little groups meeting, and we're trying to bring everyone together to kind of cross-pollinate. We've, we've got a pretty active JavaScript group. Uh, we, have, we have our Drupal group we've been doing for a very long time. Um, Launchpad, which is a, a kind of a tech incubator throughout the island. They have five locations now. We do meet at Launchpad. It's, a pretty, it's like a hip, hip location, you know, open, open ceilings and foosball tables everywhere. What's that? Awesome. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, we, have, we do have a barbecue in a couple weeks. We'd love to see some of you guys out there. If you want more information, you can talk to me. But uh, thanks for having me today. This was, this was great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, for, thanks for coming out here from Long Island. <laughs> thanks, man. Let me just put this back in here. It's I'm going to be the next speaker, so I'm introducing myself, as Alex mentioned. <laughs> also, does this lavalier work? Testing one, two. Can you guys hear me as good? Yeah? Yes or no? Yep. Thank you. Let me sit up here. So my name's uh, Elijah Lin. I am one of the organizers here. I work in Times Square at NBC Universal as an engineer. Um, as Alex Benson mentioned, I am I'm leaving the New York area at the end of the month, going to Portland, Portland, Oregon. As my friend Matt said, Matt always says, um, I'm going to the best coast. I'm going to be talking about um, Black Fire tonight. And um, give me one second. I'm going to get this black screen out here. How many people have used a uh, PHP profiler before? OK, I got maybe 10 hands, which is good. I'd say that's uh, for the people watching the recording. That's maybe, it's maybe about twenty percent actually, maybe ten or twenty percent. It's pretty good. All right, I have to restart this computer. I think I took it out of suspend off of a, a dock, and it's running Linux. So, uh, who in the audience has used Blackfire before? Okay, so I'm assuming, oh, we got one. Um, I'm assuming that uh, the people that raised their hands before used XHProf, is that correct? Yes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about XHProf as well. All right, so this is going to be a live demo um, tonight a little bit. It's also going to include audience participation. Um, so get your computers out if you're going to follow along. You don't have to follow along. It's completely optional. Um, but it is fun to do. And you guys can also, you can all test out Blackfire um, without actually doing much. All right. That took, that, that took uh, no time at all. Um, all right, so tonight, Blackfire.io is the actual name of the product. It's a, it's a service, basically. Um, and uh, here we go. Um, so while well, I'm going to give a little bit of history, uh, but but in the meantime, if you go to bit.ly Blackfire Companion, um, you can download a Chrome extension. It's real simple. It's all you have to do to participate tonight. Um, I'll show why in a little bit. But if you do that, so go to bit.ly. I'll leave it up here for just a second longer. Bit.ly Blackfire Dash Companion. Uh, that's the name of the Chrome extension. Blackfire actually consists of a few different pieces, but this is the piece that you need to, to kind of hang in here for tonight. And um, it's quick and simple auth with GitHub or Google. Um, and just do that, and, and you'll be up and running. Um, we'll revisit this in just a little bit. And I'm going to go over some history of XHProf and Blackfire. Um, first, we're just going to start with XHProf. Um, so XHProf is a tool that we can use to 
profile PHP, basically. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it looks kind of gibberishy, but um, you can see on how many function calls were made for certain things. So you can see here um, oh, wait a minute, that, that what happened to my touch screen? Here we go. You can see right there, um, Drupal attributes was called 396 times. Um, it's a little hard to see. Uh, you can see that that took eight milliseconds, 8,000 something microseconds. This is a good tool. It works. I've used it many times over the years. It's been very useful. Um, I have found Blackfire to be a little bit better in some ways, and, and it has its caveats, of course. But this is what's called a run. So this is one run on a web page um, or some kind of a request. And this is the, the, the total output of every little piece of time that it took and how much memory it used and all that. I'm not going to delve too deep into this because this is not XHProf talk. XHProf was open sourced by um, Facebook. Um, they did it in April 2009. And it said, it is now made available as open source. The community adopted that, had a great time. Um, then after time, uh, it was, it says XHProf has been a bit abandoned <laughs> since Facebook uses Hip Hop VM now, uh, which is their kind of fork version of PHP. Um, so then um, the tool, the team or the tool set that used XHProf internally at Facebook was called Fabricator, and then Fabricator's lead developer, Evan Priestley, left Facebook. To, um, to start a new company called Facility. So then Facility ended up taking over XHProf. And you can see the last commit, I just took the screenshot today, was February of 2015. Somebody asked, is the project dead? You know, this guy says he's maintaining it, Evan. Um, it is maintained, it's, it's there. Um, it's just not got Facebook's backing. Um, there are some other forks that have come out since then, these right here. Uh, there are people using them. They're good. Um, they're a little bit more recent activity, but not much. Um, then this guy came along, Fabian Potentier. He's the creator of S Sensio Labs, and Sensio Labs created Symphony and Twig. Some of you guys may know that. They are being used in Drupal 8 now. Um, he also created Blackfire. Uh, December 2014 was the start of this project. Um, it was originally a fork of, it says right here, Blackfire started as a fork of XHProf, but after some time, decided to start over and lower the overhead significantly. Um, so it did start out as a for fork. It's not a fork anymore. Um, and you can run it on, most importantly, you can run this on production servers with no overhead, um, which is really key. You can now profile your, all your stuff on, on production servers. Um, that's the key feature for me, if I want to have somebody run a profile and send it to me. Um, one of the key features, I, there's a lot of them that, I, that have compelled me to really like this solution. So, but, but just, you know, backstory, at Fabian, it's a tremendous contributor to the open source software community, especially the PHP community. The guy knows PHP pretty well, so they rewrote everything from like the ground up. Uh, this tool actually shows you garbage collection time, which uh, XHProf doesn't. That's one of the, the kind of things they say is, is better and all that stuff. Um, this tool also, if you get a certain version, shows you all the curl requests and um, the time spent um, with uh, MySQL. Um, so there's a book, um, 24 Days of Blackfire. They give them out of the Drupal cons and stuff. My, could you hand that book out? No, I have it right here. Sorry. This is the book right here. I'm going to be going over uh, uh, day four and day five of this book with you. Now, you can get it online. I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, I'll pass this around real quick. You guys can just toss it around. Just know it exists. I kind of like books sometimes still. Who likes books still? Wow. Way more than half <laughs> like books still. Wow, I'll pass this around. Um, they were going to ship us some swag to give out, but I didn't tell them I was giving a talk. So keep your eye out for the books. They love passing those books out at conferences and stuff like that. Um, this is a quick uh, just screenshot 
of what Blackfire looks like. Um, it looks a little bit similar to XHProf, but it's a little bit more fancy. This is a web-based view. The other one's a web uh, HTML view too. It also has this, um, uh, I think they call it a, a call graph. Um, on the right-hand side, it shows the order of execution, which function's called which ones, and you can zoom out and all that stuff. XHProf has that also. It's not nearly as fancy or easy to use or zoomable, and it's just a bitmap on XHProf. This one's interactive, and you can click it and all that fun stuff. Um, so let's try it, okay? So whoever wants to follow along, get your computers out. Um, the, you can Google this first link if you want. It'd probably be easier, 24 days of Blackfire, than typing it in manually. Um, and we're going to go to day four. So I'll give you guys a second to do that. Um, the people who do want to follow along should have their extension installed already. Um, I'm going to go through the, the first link, so you don't really have to go there, but just know that's reference. Um, the second one is the actual application we're going to be profiling. Um, I do have to, I realize all my, my tabs closed, so um, I'm going to open it up anyways. Blackfire. 24 days index, so I'll just show you guys real quick anyways. So this is this is the uh, 24 days. You can see right here, we're going to click on day four there. Day four, your first profile. We're going to skip ahead. You don't need to install everything except for the extension. Oh, I forgot to actually step back one second. So the way I like to think of Blackfire is that I'm in a basement and there's some windows, and um, and they they let some light in. I can see a little bit. I can see like the stairs, faint outlines, and all that stuff. But Blackfire or XHProf, um, along with XDebug, are like two really good flashlights. Um, and you need those flashlights to see things. Um, if you don't, you can feel around. You can eventually figure stuff out. But it's a lot slower. It takes a lot longer, and um, it's really just great to have that flashlight in your tool belt. So I highly recommend everybody learns a profiler. Um, and this translates also into Chrome if you, or, or kind of Firefox dev tools with JavaScript. They have JavaScript profilers if you're going to be doing front end stuff. Um, it's the same concept. is really see where all this time takes and what's, where, the, where the execution points happen, how much memory things are taking, um, what you're waiting on. Um, so. Um, we're on day four here, and I'm not going to like go too deep into this, but I'm going to show you guys what to look for. So we're going to go to this link here, the first one here, and um, get list.demo.blackfire.io slash twig. There's a capital T, a case-sensitive URL here. Um, so get list.demo.blackfire.io slash capital T W I G. Who is following along just to get an idea here? About 10 people. This is great. If anybody uh, wants me to slow down, like just go back a step, let me know. I, I know how it is to, to miss a step. Um, so here's our application. This is Git List Demo. It's a Twig repo viewer. Um, and who, who, who is, who's following along and is not on this page yet? Are you, are you, you want some time to get there? Yep. Oh, wait a second. All right. All right. So we should all have a Blackfire extension installed now, um, Blackfire Companion. And you can simply click this. And if you're not logged in, it'll ask you to log in. So I'm just going to. Log in. Some of you guys may have this, so please log in, it says. Now I'm going to log in with GitHub. And um, now I can go back to Git list. So is anybody not logged in yet? Okay. All right, so we're going to click this. And now we're simply going to click the profile button. And you're going to see this quickly. It's going to go increments of 10. And that's each 10% each increment is a run. So it's actually getting a, a mean average over 10, 10 requests. It's not just doing one. So it's getting a, an idea for it all. We can actually click here. We can name it. We'll, we'll call it twig 
number one, right? Um, names it, you can see it took 144 milliseconds on average over those 10 requests. Um, 89.9 milliseconds in IO wait time. Um, 53.6 milliseconds in actual CPU execution time. 2.29 megabytes of memory here. It, it could be, and I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Yeah, Scott is saying that, could we explain why some people might get di different results than others? Because this is a application under load right now. Um, all you guys are using the same application, um, and that's, that's a, a factor. So we're going to hit view profile right here, um, right there, up at the top. And then we're going to be taken to our profile page. This is a, a link, actually. If you look up there, it's, it's a link. You can... Um, you can ultimately share it with people. There's a, a share button right here. Um, I click that. I can actually make it public, and I can confirm it, and I could save it. I can even embed this link. So you could actually set up your Slack to embed these profiles um, inside your Slack. Um, I haven't done that yet, but it's totally doable. Um, so let's take a look at our profile. Uh, first thing is if you hover over this top left item, twig number one, um, you can, you can see there's a 200, it was a get, it was for that resource. Um, this is your running PHP 5.6 OS. Um, profile is generated outdated Blackfire probe. That's interesting. Um, earlier today when I was doing this, um, it was saying that the server was under load and it showed the load of the server. So if you click that, does anybody click that and have, have a, a little uh, bullet there that says the server was under load and the load amount? Nobody. Okay. It's Frank, um, you, uh, I can repeat your question. Just clarify, like, the server that we get this or what we run the profile under, you can't oh, any I will. Yes, I will clarify this. So in this particular setup, um, what happened in the BlackBerry extension is installed in your, your computer. Um, it sends a header, an, in the, an HTTP header in the request to that particular server at blackfire.io. Um, the server will then look for that header. If it sees that header and you have authentication, um, you, it will trigger a profile. Um, this particular setup, they have hot-rotted that, that server um, to allow anybody that doesn't have authentication, like anybody can run profiles on that server. Um, this will not be the case in your setup. It's, it's locked down. Nobody can run profiles against your server unless you, you authorize it. Um, they do say that in the, in the day four right here. Um, here, just do that. I'll just show real quick since, oh. You can see right here, it, 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 if you're on that day four, it'll, it'll, it'll talk about that. So you can read about that. Um, so you've just generated a Blackfire profile. This is literally how easy it is. Um, now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the analysis here. Um, and we'll see, so mine was 144 milliseconds. What did everybody else get? Can I sh show out some numbers? 145. 147. 102, Scott got a faster one. What? 104, 106. All right, so we're, we're 100 to 150 milliseconds. 80.1 milliseconds, there we go. In the actual uh, documentation here, it, it claims that it'll take, um, you know, I think it's 80 milliseconds. But there's, there's more people using this and, and whatnot, so. Um, all right, so let's look at this real quick. By default, this is gonna be your important part right here. If you look there, you can see the ex there's an exclusive cost, uh, exclusive wall time and in inclusive wall time, and then there's um, the amount of calls. So let's explain that real quick. Um, exclusive means that that, that function was how long that function took to run, not including any of the functions that it called. Um, inclusive means the amount of time that function took to run 
plus all of its children that it called. Um, so stream select is a native PHP function, and we can't actually optimize that. Um, actually, this is interesting. This totally messes with my demo. So this, whole, this all looks different than earlier. Let's see what's going on here. Um, oh, maybe I, did I actually, that's very interesting. So I like this too, you can search. Um, version, get version is actually, so the, what the demo is going to be is doing get version, right? Um, but it is not accurate right now in the, in the, for the demo um, that that actually, why is that? That took 50 milliseconds. It should be at the top here. Let's see what's going on here. Version. It does say it was inclusive time. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sort it by inclusive, but it, um, Well, oh well, I'll figure that out later. So get version takes 50 milliseconds of that. But you can, so it's, this is literally like you've got to use your brain a little bit and look at what functions might be um, optimizable. You know, it does, it does give you a flashlight, but you still got to know like, hey, that's an interesting looking object over there. Let's go see what that is. Um, so get version, if you look at that, you can click on it, and it'll bring that out. And now if you click the magnifying glass, it'll bring that up in the call graph over on the top right. Um, and you can see that that, in turn, is call calling this run. And then, let's see here. And you can't, the XHProf call graph is not easily this navigatable at all. Um, So, and we can see that this get version here ultimately calls stream select, right? Which was called 81 times throughout the entire process. Um, if I click on here, I can highlight that on the left. I can say that took 61.5 milliseconds. Now, the big picture here is that it's a native function. We can't optimize that function. But we can optimize the amount of times that it's called. Yeah, sorry if it's hard to see. Um, so the story goes basically like this, and that, um, let's see if I can shift over here. This is the code for that page, and this is the code for get version. And basically all this does is, um, is, is return a string, and get version is the version of I think it's the, um, the version of git or the version of git link or whatever it is. Um, and that is likely to be the same every single time you call it. And you're calling it 10 times. So you can use PHP static caching um, to, to not call all that logic 10 times, which ultimately calls that function um, stream select. <clears throat> and you can see here, if we look at just this code added here, this is a common pattern in PHP, for those of you who've seen it before. Um, we just use the static word, and that will cache, cache that, um, that variable. Um, you check if it's null the next time around. If it's not, then you know, go ahead and use that. And still trim it like you do at the end here, um, and then carry on and return. Um, so let's see. They they have done us a favor, and they have deployed this code already. And you guys can go run another profile on it right now. So if you go to bitly slash blackfire dash twig dash fix, I'll go there too.
Now, if you notice the URL, it's a totally different URL on platform.sh. Um, I will go back to that URL one more time uh, for those of you who need some time. bit.ly slash blackfire dash twig dash fix. And, um, and now let's go ahead and run another profile. Click profile. It's going to do that. This is with the new code. It actually looks like it's taking longer for me. And now I'm going to call this twig number two. So 137 milliseconds for me. The first one was 144 milliseconds. It is faster. Um, view profile. And now, if we look at stream select, we have 47 calls now, and the exclusive time is 56.4 milliseconds. We can go back to twig number one, and we can see that stream select was 61.5 milliseconds before. I think there's some differences on the load of the server right now. Um, like if you were running this without load, um, I think it'd be a better win. Um, so when you are running stuff on your local environment, you'll have control over that. Um, but it's also very important to note when you're running these profiles on production, you won't have a chance to do that. Um, so it's, it's your behavior of your application will change under load and stuff you'll, won't, won't always look the same. Um, anyways, um, so that's that. And then um, if we do this one more time, um, we'll go back to our main page. We can also create a reference. And a reference allows us to make a comparison. I'll, I'll show you this real quick anyways. Um, if you click the black fire top left link, you can go to your dashboard. And you can actually trigger comparisons from, so I have right here twig number one, and twig number two. I can go from twig number one, and I can go to twig number two. And now I can, um, Wait a minute, it's weird, what's going on here? From, to, is there a bug? That's not what I wanted. <laughs> Compare from, to, there we go, I just, it was taking a while. And I can see that I went from, you know, it actually shows you a diff so to speak, you can see up here, I had a 4.29% improvement in performance. It's not great, but it's better. Um, it shows the before and after time. Um, it shows the savings. And you can use this to, to really see if, did, did my change make things better? Maybe it made something better in one spot, but it made it worse in another spot. Um, in this case, it's better all around. Um, it's also using a little bit less memory now. Um, this is just an incredibly useful flashlight. You can see over here, all the blue ones, that means there's less calls, basically. Uh, I'm sorry, less time. It, it, it'll show a plus or minus here, so we can see this get response for control result event here. There's a minus one for some reason. Um, let's see what that is. Looks like it was only one call, and now it's that doesn't even call that anymore. Um, you can see the red, so it all looks pretty good. And then if we keep going, there we go. And we can see our stream select is minus 33 calls. These Unix pipes read and write, which is part of the stream select, I'm guessing. Um, and then we can go to our version. And I would think it would have said 10 less calls. Let's see if the comparison went to the right one. 
I'm sorry, nine less calls. Um, you're right, actually. Yes, you are right. Yeah, sorry. Nick brought up a good point. It's still cold. It's just cached. So this is a really good tool. Um, you can also click this button up here to take off the delta, um, the delta comparison. If you have the enterprise version, there will be two other icons up here to show you the curl request in the SQL request. Uh, in Drupal, it does not, um, Drupal doesn't do curl requests. It actually does a different method. Um, so it w Drupal would still just show up under, you would search for HTTP in your functions here. It's a really good way in Drupal to see if the, an external network request is slowing you down. Um, look at that stuff. Um, uh, an, an example, the other day, one of our applications was calling curl 10 times. Um, it could easily replace that with curl multi. It was actually just waiting for the response to come back every time. Um, so it was doing 10 requests, you know, waiting, 10, you know, another one, another one, another one. Do curl multi, it's only going to be as slow as the, the longest taking one. And it issues all of them at once instantly. Um, as, as long as your server can handle, uh, you know, we put 5,000 curl requests out at once, not all of them might work. Um, so the beauty of this is that you can now share a comparison. And I can share this link and I can ask, say, hey, I'm, I'm seeing slowness um, or, or I, look, I made this fix. I want to share this with you over email. You can actually send it to people and they can look and say, hey, this is faster. Um, that is amazing. If you try doing that in XHProf, you have to save each XHProf file. Um, and you have to, you know, then you can do it. You can, XHPuff does allow you to do comparisons. It does work good. Um, but it's just more to manage. And these having links is just a wonderful thing. Um, and you can also get a, a link for the graph. Um, if you share a link to a profile or a comparison, they so the caveat of Blackfire is that on the free plan, they only stick around for a day. Um, it's probably fine for a lot of people. Um, of course, you know, the, the, they want you to buy a plan. You, know, you keep the profiles a little bit longer. Enterprise, I think, is still only 90 days. Um, but if you share a profile or a comparison, they're, they're just there. They don't go away. Um, so that's if you want to kind of keep one and keep it from going away, just, just share it. Um, I don't know how if that's going to stay that way forever. Um, any questions so far? Uh, uh, microphone. Uh, Ben's got a mic for you, Frank. Is it open source? It's a very good question. So um, it's not open source right now. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see if they gain more users or more people would adopt it if it was open source. Um, I know I definitely have reservations, but, I, but here I am talking about it because I love it so much. And I, I think it's a really great tool. And um, it's, I guess it's, I feel like it's kind of like people that use Macs. You know what I mean? They love it so much. They're just going <laughs> to not going to let They're not going to use Linux, you know, this beautiful free operating system right here. <laughs> Um, I think it'd be really interesting to see how many people would be more inclined to use Blackfire if it was open source. All right, I got six, seven, eight hands, nine, ten, oh, quite a few hands up here. Um, how many people would not would, would use XHProf instead of Blackfire because it's not open source? I got about three hands. Okay, it's it's really good to know. Um, Scott, do you have a question? I do. Let me just take one for a second. Just to, just to piggyback on what Elijah was saying, I'd be curious. I don't know that this room can really speak for that, but I'd be curious to know, to just imagine maybe how many enterprise clients might potentially buy their service, the services that they have around this. How many more if it were open source? Yeah. You know, because if the usership goes up, and the knowledge about it spreads. I'm not saying I can guarantee they'll make more money. Not that you guys are listening. But if they were, 
it would be interesting to do some A-B testing on that, maybe some users testing. Yeah. You know? That's all. Thank you. Tiny I, plug. I do remember, I'm not, I'm not an expert on Blackfire at all, I do remember they have one component of it open source. It might be the Chrome extension, but I think it's a different piece of it, and I could Google it right now, but I'm not going to do that. Um, you saw it? Yeah, I, I saw that. I, I feel like maybe they have plans. I mean, Fabian in, is like a huge contributor to the open source movement. He like gets it, you know? Um, so I don't, I don't know. It would be very interesting to see what happens with that. Um, any questions so far on Blackfire? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, so I'm going to finish with um, a case study. So I was using I had a, a application that I used. Um, I'm sorry. I, I maintain an API for NBC Universal. It's uh, for our TV Everywhere project. Um, it it um, is very slow response times. Um, it's mostly cached. Um, Akamai. It's 100% hit rate in the dashboard, so it's not, it's not like kits are coming in all the time. But every day, 1,000 or so users out of 10 million um, make it through to our origin. And they experience a four-second, uh, depending on which, which calls, it's like a two to four-second response time, um, which is pretty slow, especially for an API. Um, so this is a, a case study. I, I did XHProf analysis originally, and then I found the issue, well, I, an issue, and it was field collection is a module that is used in the Drupal community to kind of like make combo fields, which is like fields within one field that you can create more of. Um, and there's a new module called multi-field that Dave Reed, one of the most popular Drupal contributors out there, very hard working guy, um, made to kind of combat the form performance problems of that. So this, the way this fits in with the Drupal meetup um, is that I was able to identify with XHProf um, some big time spent um, doing entity loads, actually. Um, we are using uh, Entity Cache. So for those of you who don't know, Entity Cache is a module that um, caches all entity loads into Memcache. Well, at least that's what we have it set up. Um, and memcache is, I don't know if it's always faster or not, but if people use it to offload their MySQL instances. Um, there's some debate on that. Um, but we saw 7,000 um, entity loads, basically, from field collection. So every time we were loading one node, uh, and there was two field collections on the page, um, it would it would load three entity loads instead of one entity load. So it's kind of just, there's a massive amount of, of data. So multi-field takes away those other entity loads. And um, anyways, I'm gonna show you. Um, I'm just gonna show you here, a little cool. So here is an API request for the field collection version. You can see how long it's taking. Actually, I think it's populating memcache right now. No, that's not even right. We'll just do this one here. Oops. Yeah, I think it is. Just gotta... Yeah, it is popular in mem uh, uh, memcache real quick. It only does that once. So it's, it's loading all the entities in a cache right now. Um, but just bear with it. It takes like 30 to 60 seconds. That one unlucky user, when cache is flush, just, they just leave. <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, preserve the log real quick. And you can see here, we'll do a filter on that. And then um, we'll refresh. Go ahead and pop that back in there. And hide that. The content's not important, so I'll pop that out there. Um, time. It's 4.75 seconds on my local computer. My local computer is not as 
you know, performant as our development service, but we're looking at the difference, right? And the improvement, the ratio. So it's not a big deal. Um, I'm just showing you in the browser to get an idea for things. I'll do another load. It's 4.62 seconds. And I have another local instance set up. And we'll change the domain here. MF. Preserve the log. I think this one has to populate a little bit too. Clear that out real quick. You can see here that switching from field collection to multi field uh, took us from about four and a half seconds to under two seconds. Um, huge win. And that allowed, and, and this is after we did some of the work. We had a lot of usage of the field collection API. Um, so it took a while to actually do this. It wasn't just like, oh, let's turn it on and migrate the fields. Um, it didn't work that way. But that's just showing you the browser. So I can now black fire this. And I'm just going to actually make uh, a reference, create a new reference. And then when I, oh, you'll see, when I make another profile, can actually use a reference to compare it to right in one shot. I don't have to go to the dashboard to compare it to. So you can create a reference to say like this is tag 15.1 and you could say this is this is what we're going to be testing against. So all future performance improvements are going to go against that reference. Um, so I'll go and you can, so here's another button you might want to disable aggregation. Um, this just only does one shot. Maybe you have a fresh cache like hit you want to measure and you don't want to measure all that other stuff, that because that's going to mess up your 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 average. Uh, so you can always check that. And uh, so we're gonna, let's go ahead hit profile on the field collection version. Now it's going to do ten runs, so that's going to take fifty seconds, right? And you'll see the profiling. I'm not authorized. Oh, I can't I can't do this because I installed PHP 5.6 recently, and I didn't install the Blackfire probe. So that's okay. I have a, I wanted to show it to you, but I have a, a, a comparison already. Um, if I go here, shared profiles, and I can go to field collection. This was uh, done a while ago, but I did, you know, I can show you that. So we can see here, let's assume I did do the profiles. Um, we went from, in this particular case, it was 10 seconds to 3 seconds. Right, um, the ratio is going to be different on production server, of course, but again, significant improvements. And if we really want to narrow in, um, we did. Now we're doing 4,651 less entity loads. Now, even though it's at min cache, that still took um, six, 5.88 seconds. You can see that, right? 6.42 seconds. Now we're down to 540 milliseconds in entity loads. Um, just Amazing. So now we can actually take this data and show people, like, this is, this is the work we did, and this is how much better it is. Um, it's, it's just a, a really nice tool. Um, I do wish it was open, but uh, I'm going to use it for now, just like I use PHP Storm right now. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of us probably do that. <clears throat> um, and we always pick, I always pick, you know, an open tool when I, when I can, and it's better. So maybe we'll get there. But this is a really cool product, and um, and uh, I encourage you to try it out. Um, lastly, I want to end with um, so there's integration with GitHub. So I remember reading somewhere that Fabian really built this like with performance testing in mind. So there's support. Um, to set up your CI system or CD system when you check in code to actually kick off performance regression tests. Um, and then Blackfire will actually post back to that issue and actually fail or pass that test on that PR. Um, we're working on doing that at NBC Universal. But I might not. I'm leaving. I'm going to Portland. I'm, I'm not going to be there. So by the time it gets implemented, I probably won't be there. Because the enterprise moves a little slow sometimes. Um, there's New Relic integration. So if, 
if something spikes in New Relic and it triggers an alert, it can actually trigger off. I can actually trigger Blackfire endpoint and then trigger a deeper performance analysis because you can't get this type of detail in a New Relic report. Um, for enterprise deployments, there's a Puppet module. I, I think I had this in there because we use Puppet and I was trying to sell our ops team on that. Um, there's general webhooks you can set up to do things. Um, you can also set up scheduled runs to run like every six hours in your production, maybe every 10 hours, 12 hours. Um, and you, you, there's also a CLI tool, so I can run Blackfire on the command line, and I can run, I can run anything curl can run. So Blackfire, it's actually Blackfire curl, whatever. So it actually uses libcurl. Um, so anything that's supported by libcurl will work. Um, all the same structure and everything for it's not some new new syntax and format you have to learn um, so you can you can actually I'm not going to show this right now but uh, some of you may know this you can um, let's see here if I you can right click on uh, requ re requests in the Chrome DevTools and you can copy as curl and you can actually paste like an Ajax request that you want to profile into your Blackfire um, command line um, anyways, it's all really, really fun stuff, um, and uh, that's it. That's all I got. Um, the documentation and resources slide, if anybody you know, wants to go more into here. There's also a bunch of other people in the Drupal world and, and other parts of the PHP world that are doing demos and videos on this stuff. Um, anyways, any questions? All right, got one question, John, John Todd. Uh, I think you made a, a great uh, case for the use of Blackfire against uh, x86 prop. Good job. Um, you. you mentioned New Relic and you mentioned uh, Enterprise. Um, I'm wondering if you could, and I know this is a day three question, you covered days four and five, but um, could you talk about how it compares and what, what it does differently? How it might be bit, um, a good tool? For uh, So to review the question, how it so compares to x prop? Blackfire versus New Relic. New Relic? Ah. Um, I don't honestly know. Um, I don't use New Relic that much. I got conf like confused and frustrated with trying to get the data that I wanted out of it. Um, I mean, it's good to look at like server load and stuff like that. And I'm just an amateur at it. Like I haven't spent. Oh, Scott, you might actually be able to compare it. I think oh, Scott's trying to say something. Just, just in to put it on a bumper sticker, New Relic is an aggregate tool, whereas this isn't. That's that's the that's the main difference. They're really two different types of tools. But the idea that you can not the idea the um, the, car the dangling carrot, that's, that's like an amazing idea that you could connect these profiles into New Relic is pretty cool. The idea that you, once you actually get to the point in aggregation where you pretty much hit a wall, um, if you have real examples to drill down into, that would be amazing. So I'm, I'm hoping that's what that means. Um, but as I've looked into it, I haven't been able to discover more. What I would add, that's great, Scotty, thank you. And what I would add is that uh, New Relic is application performance monitoring on production systems. Yeah. Uh, Blackfire will let you do something that's uh, outside of production to help you improve your overall cycle and, and delivery. So um, in, your, in the code that you're, the quality code of, that you're delivering. So that's the main thing I would say. And that's, I think, day three. All right. Yeah, they do, they do have, um, yes, they do, you're right. They do have, um, what is it? What is Blackfire? And then they have Blackfire versus New Relic here. So if you want to read about that? Yes, I think you read that already. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, to follow up on that. So Blackfire is not something to implement at all on production. Um, uh, you wouldn't uh, implement it at all on your production servers, even in a sampling mode. Oh, I don't yeah. Know if yeah. That's even people. For it, but. Yeah. It's a question. Yeah. The question is, would you implement New Relic? Blackfire. You sorry, Blackfire. Blackfire. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So New Relic you can run on production. It, it's fine on production. Blackfire was designed to be run on production. Um, you would definitely run Blackfire on production. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable running XHProf on production. Yeah, I know with XHProf there was some overhead um, in the way that it's implemented. It, it's unclear to me if Blackfire has that overhead. But you're saying, like, on your production web servers, you would install the Blackfire agent or probe. I don't know which it is, but yeah. both. And so... Um, only if you have the Chrome um, installation or the Chrome extension and you've hooked it up and sort of logged in could you see that profile data that's being collected for each, for your particular request. 
Right. That is correct. Um, I'm trying to find the spot in here where it says, like, specifically, you can run this on production. Oh, when it's not running a profile. Interesting. Yeah, so it doesn't run a production. It doesn't run a profile in production unless you pass it a header. Um, and then I think in the, um, in the command line, it's a, it's a server variable. So it's like envir I'm sorry, not a, you know, a, a command line variable. So you can set that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll, I have follow-up questions that I'll, but I'll save. Cool. Any, Any other questions? questions? Otherwise, Ben's got some more. Uh, Frank. Have you actually used the uh, PR request functionality? No, I, I've been Has trying anyone? to get it on that our servers. Cool. What's that? That looks really cool. It does. I, I can't wait because one of the, I, I just like, I, you get you get an application and the next thing you know, it takes six seconds to load. And like, how did it get so bad? Right? Like, how did this ever, how did this ever happen? And the, nobody has performance gates at all. Um, so you have to start this early on in the process. And um, so you actually set, there's a Blackfire YAML file. You actually set the paths that, I'm sorry, you actually, like, you, you pass it the thresholds that you want to, you know, do. And you can actually even, you can set other parameters, too, like how much memory usage. Um, uh, there's it's a Blackfire YAML file. It's very, it goes into detail in the book. But um, I have not got to actually do this other than, like, local development. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because I really wanted to see the performance tweaks that we made with multi-field and field collection. Like, how did that actually relate in production? Because I, you know, it doesn't. It didn't take ten. It showed ten seconds was my slow one on my local. It didn't take ten seconds. It took four and a half seconds, you know, or four seconds. Um, so I didn't actually get to see it. But you know, you still see a relative improvement, and that's really valuable. Uh, Scott, uh, just to follow up, um, I do not know the answer to this at all. Um, how the hell does... Is, I'm sorry, is your, is your oh. mic on? I don't know if that... Uh... Maybe. Okay. Maybe. You All right, let it. me point it more towards my mouth. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to this. Um, my question is, how, the, how does the PR environment set up work? I would think that you'd oh, still you, need you your still own... Oh, you still have to... Sorry, go ahead. You'd still need your own CI yes. integration. Otherwise... Yeah, so it makes me wonder what Blackfire's PR integration actually does if you're doing it all yourself. You, 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 you trigger, basically, once your environment is built right. um, with your PR, you trigger right at the end of that script, that whatever CI you know, that you're doing to build that environment out, um, you hit a Blackfire endpoint. You pass it the PR number. And then you give that application access to your repo to be able to post messages, right? To do, to, right, but since And then it posts back yeah. that, so it, that's how it works. Right, but then how is that any different from setting it up on any other website, since you have to do all that yourself anyway with your own CI tools? I'm just curious what, why they boast integration with PR environments, unless they do something extra. Well, I mean, that's it's like... I'm curious about, yeah. yeah the, it, commit, I guess, oh, commit I status API. I got it, know. got it, got it. They might give some extra, extra measurement around it or something like that. The Blackfire logo, right? <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Thanks. Right. Right. Exactly. And again, that was why I was initially asking because if you're setting up your own any of your other servers in this exact same way, with all of these exact same tools, why would, why, I, I had been wondering, why would Blackfire care whether that was a GitHub PR environment that you, your own CI tool had set up, or whether it was some other thing? And it sounds like maybe it uses the GitHub API to pass some cool graphs or something back, or I don't know. I was just curious. I would think it would work with anything. Right. Yeah, I don't actually right. know, so when it passes it back, I don't know, like, like this. Yeah, you're right. You hit on the right answer. I think uh, the, it's the GitHub APIs and probably the web hooks are the first way to integrate, uh, I would guess. I, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. If, if you set up so a... GitLab, you can set up a free trial. Like, I lost it, actually, on here. And it actually shows you the integrations. Um, yeah. So if you guys set up, like, a fresh account, basically you can see a little bit more of that. 
Um, I don't have it anymore. But um, anyway, it looks pretty straightforward, like to me. Um, I'd love to try it out. The, the, so the big the big difference you're going to need to do is um, I think Probo CI uses this actually. Um, it might actually be good to try this with Probo CI. I don't know because they they use a, a different they use a, that bare metal backend. It's not it's like it's like exactly Packet. the hardware you pay for. So you could that what's that? Packet.io or packet.net or something? Anybody know? Packet.net. Packet.net. And uh, so you, so that might like if you have a PR environment that's being shared resources and you're trying to do tests against it, then that's not going to help you make relative comparisons. Um, so you do need to, to like have no load on that environment, and it's always more accurate if you can, like the bare metal concept was appealing to me because it's not like some fluctuating, like maybe they give you a little bit more CPU because they have it available or something like that. Um, like that was appealing to me as far as that goes because um, when you do do these performance regression tests on your PRs, um, you have to have consistency at, at you have to have that part to be stable. If your code's changing, your hardware's got to stay the same. Otherwise, you're not going to know. Just like we did, we all did performance profiling right here. We we all got different numbers because we're all using it at the same time. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, any other questions? Ben? Yeah. So you're not using the premium edition at NDCU, or do you know anybody that is? We're, we're in the process of buying an enterprise license, um, but that is just it's so slow. I wish it would happen sooner. Because I, I asked because one of my concerns is shipping off, you know, basically shipping off live data on a run uh, to Blackfire. Like, yeah. You know, um, customers inputting data. There's, it sounds like the agent or the probe or something that's actually running before the data is shipped does some sanitization, but I don't know if there's a way to hook into that, you know, sort of how, how good that system is. Yeah, they have a security about. chart on here. They, I don't know where it is, but um, I just want to... Here, I'll just pull it up real quick because they do they do talk about exactly this question you have. I feel like they do at least. Um, I'll go back up here to 24 days. Maybe it's a FAQ or something. Yeah. So, so they have, you can like read up a little bit on this, but... They do talk about um, confidentiality and privacy here. They do not collect user session data. They do not collect data from the database. They do not collect any source code. They only collect method, function, class names as called, you know, quality pairs. Um, they anonymize SQL queries and HTTP calls. So these are all SSL. Like when you're going over, you know, HTTP, you're going over HTTPS. Um, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not an expert at security, but you are, I think, aren't you? Um, <laughs> and um, maybe you could uh, get a little lightning talk on it someday, or something like that. Because I mean, it looks it looks great to me, right? It looks like oh, that's pretty good. Um, but I don't. I don't know if they have any flaws in their their strategy there. Um, I, there is a real quick. There is a you know GitHub section here. Uh, I'll just put this on the screen for anybody who wants to read it. Um, oh, integrations are available only to enterprise users, so there you go. Uh, enterprise pricing that I got just, you know, was like five users. So, so the way it works is you have developers, um, the seats basically, and um, you can run your profiles. Um, and you can swap developers in and out. And I think it was $5,000, no, $4,000 for a year. Uh, for five users, and then you get like certain amount of environments that you can use. Um, and then they, they can, you can always, they're very flexible. Uh, and I, I, sh can't, I shouldn't say pricing because that could all change, but um, you know, that's, that's what I know so far. There's always negotiations and stuff, obviously. So there's, this, is, this goes really deep. There's so much more to this. Um, he really, thought this through as far as making like a complete PHP performance solution. Um, it's funny though, because like, you know, we want to make our back ends super fast, but our front ends are still pretty slow sometimes. <laughs> you know, they're just 
So the people that are new, this is only one part of the puzzle. Um, if you ship a bunch of, you know, JavaScript that is just running and running and running and running like a marathon, um, your front end's going to be slow. What is 200 separate JavaScript files? 200 separate JavaScript files is fine over HTTP2 now, right? <laughs> uh, and believe it or not, there's like 70% adoption in browsers for HTTP2. Um, supposedly, I was looking on the web the other day. No, you want to actually not minify your, you, you want to actually not concatenate and squash those files now in HTTP2. It actually is the anti-pattern. So the new future is all separate files, and then all those files are cacheable. And if you will change one, then just one changes. You don't have to invalidate all that content. So that's what we do in Drupal right now. As long as they're well written, Scott says. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to repeat, but I'm not doing a good job at it. There's a lot of, yeah. Any other last questions? All right, thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Um, I have to do closing remarks, and I got a, a clicker here. Um, and let's see here, maybe we got, oh, there we go. And I'm gonna click the button. Next meetup, all right, um, October 5th, it looks like. It's the first Wednesday of every month. If this is your first time uh, here, please come back. We do this every month. The first Wednesday usually, um, every now and then, like once a year, it seems like it doesn't work out that day. Um, but anyway, come back. Uh, we're gonna all, all uh, probably not all, but some of us are all gonna go to an after party right now. Um, sponsored by Fastly. Um, Get some drinks and, and hang out and socialize, ask some more deep questions, meet some more people. And uh, who's coming to the after party? All right, well, that's a decent amount. Uh, I'd say about uh, two thirds of the people. No, a third of the people, sorry. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. And um, we'll see you next time. I'm not going to be here, actually, so uh, <laughs> these guys will see you next time. Thank you, Elijah. <laughs>